Um, thanks for coming on an extraordinarily warm night. Uh, feel free to like unhook your seats and give yourself some space if you'd like to do so. Um, needless to say, because we're in San Francisco, we don't have air conditioning. This is just what we got. Uh, welcome to all friends who I see regularly. Welcome to new friends and faces. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. So we are a volunteer run Dharma center, which is quite unique in that we literally are here because of generosity. Uh, so everybody here is offering their time, the volunteers and the board and myself, and just really lovely to have a space to come together and be in community and practice. And the format of our evenings together is I will introduce us to the theme tonight, and we will continue to make our way through the text of this book. Getting close now towards the end. And this book chronicles the historical life of the Buddha, which is just, just so sweet to learn about how he lived and actually to learn about some of the adversities and challenges of where these teachings came from and how they came to life through his practice, through his seeing of the world, through his meeting of other beings. Um, and then we will have a discussion together. Part of our kind of contract here together that when we show up in this room together is one of community and connection. And that requires that we bring kind of the values of practice into our conversation with one another. And one of the primary values of our practice is compassion. So this includes a compassionate listening and a compassionate speech inner speech and outer speech. So what's easier a little sometimes, the outer speech, we can kind of pay attention to what we say, but what if I invited everybody for the next hour and a half to be just so kind to yourself, everything you say to yourself in your mind? Are we in? Yeah. yeah. Including like, why am I falling asleep? Oh my God, what did she say? I hate meditation. Like just kind, like, you know, be nice to yourself in, in this practice time. It's such an amazing opportunity to be here together, supported by community, to really try this, you know, kindness towards ourselves and others. And in the discussion part of our evening, so when we'll be talking a bit more about our practice and about these texts, it's really important to practice also that compassion for others. Right. When people ask questions or share their experience, really remembering that this other person, just like you, is a being who wants to be happy and free from suffering. Like primary, like remembering that. Everything else, you know, you cannot agree. You can um, think you're above that question, whatever it is, right, conceptually, but really holding this other person with, with care. Um, just such an amazing uh, practice, something we should absolutely do with our friends and at work, but let's deliberately try it here together. How's that sound? All right. Um, and yeah, I know it is warm, so do your best. I did mention last week I'm in full support of folks if they feel like they're falling asleep, if they want to stand up. We had a good report. I don't know where Lucas there he is. Lucas last week of standing up and you know, yeah, and it works. You're on your feet. Yep, you're on your feet. So far, didn't fall over. No. Yeah. Like it, Some yeah, and you can stand up like right in the middle of your practice. Again, you know, um, stealth method, method like Lucas did. I didn't even notice. So you make a little noise, no problem. And then you can even sit back down. It's not as though you're choosing to stand and that's it. And again, this is only if you're really feeling so tired, you're gonna maybe fall asleep. Sleep is so great. And I want you all to sleep and get, I want to get better sleep. Who wants to get better sleep? Yeah, we really need uh, good sleep. But when you sleep during practice, especially when we're here in community, it's kind of a missed opportunity. You know, it's, it's, it's really special to be here. And there's often, I don't know about you all, but there's an obstacle for me with practice of, oh, I want to practice when I'm tired, I'm full, I'm busy. You know, there's all these excuses. So let's, while we're here, really do our best to practice fully. Um, 
So for tonight, uh, as some folks were here last week, remember, we talked about just the kind of beautiful elegance of dependent origination, or this kind of core teaching of the Buddha that everything is connected to everything. And I don't know about you all, but that has just really stuck with me all week is that teaching and really thinking about this co-arising of all things and all of my experiencing being related to essentially almost that first moment of contact. I have an experience, I judge the experience. Because I judge the experience, then I react to it. And I react to it, which creates karma. And that karma then creates different circumstances that I'm in. Like, it's, it's all so intertwined. It's really, um, it's quite humbling. And I think one way for us to understand it, maybe in a more, a more simple way, is <clears throat> kind of being able to allow dependent origination to help us see how people can become misguided in this world, how easy it is to not see clearly, how easy it is to actually think I'm right and that's wrong. I mean, we so deeply want as humans for that to be true for there to be a right and a wrong. And for us to then kind of build our life around controlling being where things are right and good and away from where things are wrong. And not only is there no... Wow. What? And it's like Motown? That's great. Kind of... Oh, nice. Okay. Sorry, uh, folks at home, we have really loud music right now. Some Etta James going by. Um, so even if there were, right, something that we could designate as this is good or this is bad and, and I like this and I don't like this, if we then kind of go into this tendency of I just want to be where things are good. And I don't want things to be bad. Man, we are stuck because that's just not how it is. And we have no control, right? And it's just amazing all the examples of how little control we have over not only what's happening in the world, <laughs> like the motorcycles. Um, I hope that person's parking and coming in here. <laughs> All right. That would be really great. Um, how little control we have over the external world, even how little control we have over our own mind when we practice, right? Like, I want to have one of those good meditation practices where I feel relaxed and joyful. Like, we don't get to. Mm, just, yeah, thinking about dependent origination and how it really helps us understand and be with complexity. And helps us understand and kind of be with the fact that life is always offering us the most amazing training ground for practice, if we can just view it in that simple way. Um, so with life as a training ground, I thought it would be nice for us to start with a practice of compassion tonight. <clears throat> Bless you. There's always conditions in our world from, you know, beginningless time and until there is no more here that are difficult and painful. Um, and for many people, this last week plus is a time of even more accentuated and difficult um, experiences and I often hear from friends who are checking in or sharing, like, what do I do? Like, how do I cope with what's going on in the world? And honestly, it's, I, I really don't know what to say other than practice compassion. Like, what else can we do, right? Forging our own hearts and minds so that we can be pliable, because what's really tempting when things are so horrible is to shut down our heart. Shut it down with blame. Shut it down with despair. Shut it down by numbing out. And this radical act of keeping it open with the strength of compassion, just really training, like the most amazing training I could ever imagine. So in this practice, we will do a very kind of more traditional approach with compassion. 
really starting by generating the feeling of compassion, in some ways calling upon compassion. It's not something that's outside of us, but sometimes we forget it's already here. How do we generate that feeling of compassion within us? How do we reveal it? Then we practice it um, for people who we care about, who are suffering, and people who are close to us. And then we do this practice and kind of radiate out in circles towards even folks that we don't know, but who are suffering. And the complexity of that practice is really breaking down the barriers between who we think deserves our compassion and who doesn't. Right. And I will not be telling you who to feel and not feel. This is your gymnasium of compassion. So you get to choose who you want to practice with. But that's what we'll be doing together, making our way all the way to compassion for every single being now, past and future. I mean, that's that's like bench pressing, you know, like that's the, that's when we get the real compassion. So that's our plan. <clears throat> so I know, again, it's a little warm. And uh, we got a nice full house. So do your best to find a position that feels comfortable, something that you can hold with relative ease. It's no problem <clears throat> to shift your position if you become uncomfortable during practice at some point but it really supports you and your practice if you can have the body feel mostly at ease. So maybe, yeah, finding your last cushions or position, sip of water. Are you looking for a seat? Okay. Taking a moment and allowing ourselves to really feel a sense of relief, maybe even joy for the opportunity to turn attention inward. And finding a natural rhythm of the breath and a posture that really supports a sense of uprightness through the spine and gentleness and ease through the front of the body. Taking a moment to really feel a sense of this body being supported by the ground beneath us. And taking a moment to feel the sense of stability that the space around us can offer.
really connecting to both a physical place where we find ourselves and also this space of time. So here on this day, at this time, I'm feeling and imagining the quality of sky that is above us with that beautiful crescent moon somewhere in the sky. Already it's dark at this time, feeling the sense of the seasons. to help us more fully arrive in this moment, really think about and consider whatever is in the mind that can be just gently put down for the course of the meditation. Maybe there's some of our to-do lists. Maybe there's reflections on the day, conversations or opportunities. So amazing, this mind. We can hold so many things at once. And we can also put them down and let them be. So inviting this letting be, this simple putting down of all the things we're holding and juggling in the mind. to help the mind feel more ease. Focusing on the breath, especially noticing the breath at the belly. When we focus on breath at the belly, it can help us feel more grounded in this present space with our bodies. So inhaling and noticing the belly gently rising. Exhaling, notice it gently deflating. It's okay if you get distracted, no problem. Just return to the breath. Feel or imagine that paying attention to your breath is the most important thing you've done today. It's possible. And give that level of intention, effort to just following and noticing the breath, especially where it's easy to feel at the belly.
Just a couple more moments following the breath. Seeing how subtle you can make this noticing of the breath. Can you notice the entire inhale as it makes its way down? And can you notice the entire exhale? We'll shift our attention and awareness now from the breath and the body, to the mind, imagination, and the heart. And before we give ourselves to a practice of compassion to others, it's very beneficial to consider the compassion that we can generate within ourselves for ourselves. So taking a moment and really considering all the care and kindness that has been offered to us in this lifetime, all the compassion that has made its way into our hearts, into our minds, into our very bones, the muscles. Remembering maybe a time or a period in which we really needed care and there was care for us. Mm, taking a moment to also consider all the compassion that we've offered in this lifetime. <clears throat> all the many beings that we have supported showed up for. Again, maybe just bringing to mind one time in which we showed up and supported someone we cared for. Taking a moment to really feel the sense that that care and that kindness that we have received and extended is a living part of this body. While everything changes around us, there's good fortune and bad, people coming and going. Just feel or imagine that sense that compassion and care is ongoing, what we receive and what we offer. And feeling that this body is a body of compassion, a body infused with compassion, a body that exists because of compassion. And really bringing this through our breath as we inhale, kind of feeling and <clears throat> calling forth this compassion. And as we exhale, feeling and imagining this compassion radiating through our body. Is compassion, our heart's ability to feel care for, our heart's ability to receive care.
Now we use this revealed capacity in this body of compassion and begin by bringing to mind a single person in our life, someone who we have fondness for, who we care for, and who we know is struggling or suffering. There could be many people, but symbolically just bring forth one for now, whoever comes to mind easily. Bring this person vividly to mind. And considering their challenge and difficulty. And notice if you can experience what is often described as the heart quivering with compassion. As though the heart is almost overflowing with love and care for the difficulty of this being this beloved person. And it's from with that feeling of almost overflow that we use our breath and extend a true wish of compassion. And as we inhale, we draw in the image of this being. And as we exhale silently wishing, may you be free from suffering. May you know peace and ease. Once again, inhaling, bringing this person to mind. And exhale, radiating compassion. May you be free from suffering. May you know peace and ease. And continuing holding this person in mind, feeling that heart fullness and extending either with those simple words or the words that feel right for you. A couple more breaths here, and again, feeling a sense of the strength of the whole body as a body of compassion. And feeling the strength that this radiated wish, not only does it open our heart, it strengthens our heart. May you be free from suffering. May you know peace and ease. And gently releasing this person from the mind, returning to Focusing on the body, taking a moment, noticing how the body feels. There could be a sense of feeling full, a sense of warmth in the heart, a sense of weight in the heart. And practicing this ability to have that strength, even that weight in the heart, while still being rooted in this present moment, rooted within the body of compassion. Not falling into or being saturated by the other's suffering. No matter how beloved they are, Really feeling this body as a body of compassion and care and not losing ourselves in that care. So a couple more breaths, refreshing our sense of compassion that's present here and now.
This could feel like strength, warmth. Could just feel like ease or presence. Now we shift our attention and bring to mind a single person or maybe a group of people or part of the world where we don't know anyone specifically, but we know there is suffering. And with ourselves, again, rooted in our own bodies and our own hearts, inviting and bringing to mind the suffering that we know is occurring. Though we don't know these individuals or people, it's clear they're suffering, loss, hurt, pain, and feel once again the quivering of the heart, the desire of the heart to care. And in this training of compassion, we allow the heart to be open. And we allow the heart to be strong. And as we inhale, bringing to mind these difficulties, making them real. And as we exhale, may you be free from suffering. May you know peace and ease. And continuing with each breath, inhale, drawing in, and exhale, radiating compassion. May you know peace and ease. May you be free from suffering. And continuing to do so, again, balancing this care, this over full heart flowing over while maintaining a sense of being rooted and stable and present. With our compassion, we don't need to know why or where or how. It's just the care, just the simple, raw care that is intrinsic to this human body. May you be free from suffering. May you know peace and ease. Feeling the dignity of this practice, the power of this practice, it can't go out and directly heal or save or protect, but it can keep the heart open, keep the heart strong, keep the heart available for what is ours to do. Inhaling with that strength, strong heart, that clear heart. Exhaling, may you be free from suffering. May you know peace and ease.
And then very gently releasing the image of this person or persons or part of the world. And once again, regathering attention into the body, noticing the body, maybe what has shifted or changed in the body. What feels warm or tenderized or open. Feeling the support of the earth. Feeling the presence of the belly, the heart. The stability of this body. And returning to this training, this training ground of our compassion. And bringing to mind a person or persons or even part of the world in which we have some difficulty or challenge. Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's stronger than anger. And yet we know there is suffering there too. Every being has suffering. And considering the possibility of compassion for suffering of a being or many beings who we find difficult. So testing the waters here, this can be more challenging. The heart can be more hardened. But considering the possibility that these beings also want to be free from suffering. And while the heart may not have the same overflowing, can we extend some of that compassion from those we care about and those who it's easier for us towards a harder group or person? And so bringing this person or persons to mind with our inhale and with our exhale, May you be free from suffering. May you know peace and ease. Again, it's a training ground and a practice. It's okay if it feels awkward or hardened. Just keeping our attention on the breath and the words and simply practicing. Inhale, drawing in and considering these beings or being. Exhale. May you be free. May you know peace and ease. Just a couple more breaths here, doing our very best to break down the barriers we so often put up between ourselves and others. Then considering opening all the way, not just these difficult beings, not just these beings we don't know, not just beloved beings, can we imagine having compassion for each and every being? It's almost impossible to bring it to mind, but we can feel that 
consider the possibility of having compassion for every being, beings known and unknown, possibly even the beings of all time. Feel the radicalness, the outrageousness of the heart that is being asked to open to compassion for all beings. Still rooted in the body, supported by the earth. Inhale. Imagining this possibility, exhale, may each and every being be free from suffering. May each and every being know peace and ease. Continuing, seeing if we can really hold and feel this possibility within us. This entire body, a body of compassion, this body, heart, and mind radiating compassion without bound. May each and every being be free from suffering. May each and every being know peace and ease. This includes all the beings, of course, in this room and us, each and every one of us. May each and every one of us be free from suffering. May each and every one of us know peace and ease. And then not releasing, per se, this holding, but allowing it to recede into the background, returning to the body and breath, and just allowing ourselves to breathe as a body of compassion. Feeling this compassion as a refuge where we can be amid all the storms of this life and beyond. Thank you for your practice. Felt very powerful to do with you all. Thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate being together. The combustion sauna in here tonight. Yeah, schwitzing away in our compassion together. Any um, any questions, reflections on this practice? Anything that was 
hard, anything that felt at ease. And again, just remembering as much as possible, especially um, in this practice, really considering your own experience, right? Speaking from your own experience. Um, and uh, yeah. Yeah, what was hard, what was easeful. And compassion practices are always a little bit hard, but there's always also, or there can be a sense of real presence, connection. So if there's folks in the room, if you don't mind grabbing the mic, and if there's folks online, either raising your, your hand. Yes, please. Um. For the, uh, I guess for the first person that we were supposed to, yeah, find compassion for, I felt like I like went through a list and like sort of like had this hierarchy of who needed the most compassion and like prioritize that person. I don't know. It felt weird. Yeah. <laughs> to uh, be like, oh yeah, that person's probably doing the worst, so they deserve the most. Yeah. <laughs> but did, but did it yeah. feel good to practice for them? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I yeah. thought it was funny to like, yeah. I know. And sometimes, I sometimes I'll even like cue us like choose that person before you practice, so that you're not doing the rolodex of suffering. Uh, but it, it it's true. Like it is hard. And we can, it's, I don't, I don't know about you all, but it's fun on retreat, you know, cause people are always coming to mind cause you're, you know, you don't have a lot of stimulation and like people come to mind and you can practice for them right on the spot. And you can do that also just throughout the day, right? If we have down moments or like time, we're not doing anything, um, sometimes people come to mind and on the spot to wish them compassion. Oh, May they be free from suffering. May they know ease. It's such a nice practice to do with um, whoever comes to mind. And then also, if there's like the top four people, you can help, go home and practice for the rest of them later. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Claudia. Um, in the second part where you said to think about unknown people, maybe in the world, and have compassion for them. And I'm so glad that you reminded us to be rooted in our body because I felt overwhelmed. Yeah. I really felt overwhelmed. Like, you know, I had tears in my eyes. So that was one thing that I experienced. And yeah. the other thing towards the end where you said, imagine having compassion for every single human being and I couldn't help thinking about some real jerks, you know? And, oh my God, I mean, that was so hard. Mm. And yet, and yet, when I started thinking about their background, how maybe they didn't have love as they were growing up as children, how they may have suffered and were deprived and didn't learn how to love, that was, I mean, not to justify the yeah. actions by any means, yeah. but that made it a little easier to think about like, well, may they be at ease and peace, may, may they be free of suffering, but that was a tall order. Yeah. That was hard. Yeah. <laughs> really but hard. But that's the like, it's the bench pressing, <laughs> you know, it, it can be. And yet, you know, it's interesting because I love that you're really taking it to heart. You're really like not trying in a bad way, but like really like, let me really imagine holding because these practices are so interesting, right? We're not going out to all these people directly, right? We're just bringing them to mind. But when we take that in its seriousness, not in a negative serious way, but in a seriousness, it is a real invitation. It is like a... Am I able? Am I willing? It's actually, it's like a willingness. Yeah. Yeah. Really hard. Yeah. <laughs> and so good that you kind of 
like not in a bad way effort, but efforted, right? right? Yeah. And did it feel when you were kind of extending it? Was there some energy or some feeling with that? Did it-, it was a little easier once I thought about their why, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. uh, trying to kind of like understand where they come from. Right. You know, and again, not that I justify it, but yeah. it's almost like uh, that story that you told us about the Buddha and the the evil guy that had killed a bunch Angulimila. of people. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what, what was Angulimila. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, he was going to get the karma. Yeah. Actions, right? Yep. But uh, anyway. Yeah. So that made it a little easier. Right. And that's interesting. So you're saying, you know, in one ca- in one way, it might be easier to help justify compassion, recognizing the difficulty in the past, or as kind of in that story with the Buddha is recognizing their potential to change. Mm. Right. Because Angali Mila had killed thousands of people, but then through meeting that pure love of the Buddha, transformed and changed. So it's so interesting, like bad people who we don't like not only do we sometimes not see their past we don't see their future mm-hmm. they're flat they're not real to us mm-hmm. right and that's that kind of idea of bringing a realness of our care so thank you thank you yeah anybody anybody else i'm online i'd like to say oh something. yes hi jason hi um i wanted to just say that the when we went I can't hear you first... if you're speaking. Oh, oh, can you hear me now? One moment. Yes. Sorry about that. I did unmute. Mike, can you hear As me? It was, it was us. It was us. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, um, the the first person where we were walking through this, you know, I I, I was I just wanted to share that I, I logged on to this sensation of uh, somebody I was feeling a lot of love for, just kind of overflowing positive love. It was like that's what came to me. And then when it came to the second and third, I started um, really feeling compassion for people who were suffering. And mm. over the arc of these feelings, I hadn't, I didn't notice it, but I was, I was moist. I mean, my whole body was like, I wasn't crying because there's a difference between that sensation and what I felt, but my eyes just started watering. And I, mm. and I really felt like my body was physiologically expressing emotion, even though I was very calm and kind of practicing this. So I just, I, I wanted to share that. I don't know if I'm just sweating. It's hot where I am too, but it felt like this is, this is really interesting. You know, it's like crying yeah. without crying. And I, I feel like that's kind of a feeling I have sometimes when I meditate. And I just wonder if that's, if you could comment yeah. on that. No, so beautiful and beautifully described. And you had someone nodding here saying me too. Um, and you know, it's interesting. It's, and this is such an important nuance with our compassion practice. And I was kind of trying to help us with like staying grounded in the body and in the body of compassion while still caring is our compassion. We can have feelingfulness, but not being like overly personally, emotionally involved, And that's such an interesting balance, right? Like I care, it matters. It's kind of like, you know, my heart feels uh, tenderized. You say moistened. For me, it feels like very tenderized, right? But it's not tipping into that overwhelm of I'm so upset about this. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm over. It's, it's a really interesting one. And, you know, always this research study comes to mind that uh, Alan Wallace was involved in one of my, my root teachers. And in this study, people were practicing for three months, shamatha and the four measurables like compassion And before and after the study, they watched really horrible news clips, like soldiers talk about, you know, killing civilians and feeling shame and like just like really like, oh, and before and after the sustained meditation, in both cases, there was facial expression like emotion, but there was less distress. So the goal with compassion isn't to bypass or get rid of our feelings but to not have them be so distressing at a personal level. And this this is translated in such terrible ways. Like you get these things where 
Oh, you, you know, I, I heard this teaching once by, um, I, I think I really have to imagine it was a bad translation, but like, oh yeah. And this wonderful practitioner, his brother died and he didn't cry. And I was like, that's not what we're aiming for. Right. But it's maybe more like they didn't become like overwhelmed by sadness. Right. Like grief is such a natural process of, of loss. We wouldn't ever want to get rid of it, but what is this way that we can be with the, the grief of the world ongoing because it's ongoing. Right. And how do we not become depleted and, um, did anybody feel energized by the practice? Yeah, like that's great, right? Like that ability to use compassion as energy. So I've heard many teachers say this, and I, I really, I find it so useful. If your compassion practice is depleting you, you might be getting too like personally involved in it. How do you root back into yourself and still care? It's just such an amazing practice for all of our interactions with so many people in our own life and in the broader sphere. And, you know, with the news these days and the news almost always, can we find that rooted, compassionate stance if we decide we want to engage with the news so that we don't get lost in it, really observing or watching with that compassion and a sense of care? Um, yeah. Other questions, comments? Yes. So here in the back and in the front. It feels strange coming up and <laughs> I know I'm sitting. It's a bit awkward. Can I stay in my chair? Of course you can. <laughs> no, um, I found it a little bit difficult tonight mm -hmm. uh, because it became an intellectual exercise and it felt very different than times where compassion arises spontaneously. Yeah. So I felt like a game of like, okay, I gotta imagine somebody I came imagining compassion, but there was a separation between mm. imagining and real Feeling. compassion. Yeah. And it's different than I think of a time I was walking to work and saw crows playing in the road and there's like a moment of like, oh, that's so beautiful. And yeah. I everyone could feel this. And it was like yes. true spontaneous comp yeah. compassion. Totally. Different than being told to imagine it. Yeah. And have you done other compassion practices before of the imagining or? Um, a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. How about with the person who was close to you? Was that right? What... And that, that seems more direct and Got more it. obvious. Yeah. Almost like there is less of this intellectual game. Then. Yeah. So that's a great insight, honestly, and reflection is, you know, and that's why it's kind of we're supposed to be priming the pump and moving out. So it's almost like we ignite um, that pilot light of compassion, as Tenzin Chilki often calls it. Um, so we have that pilot light of compassion. We think of this person and like, woof, there it is, it's the flame. And then it's like, we use that energy to then extend to these others. Mm -hmm. But it can become a little bit more transactional or intellectual mm -hmm. if that feeling doesn't extend towards those others. Right. So I think that's a really good noticing. And you know, again, if this kind of practice is interesting, I would recommend like starting with that person and then maybe, you know, and this, the, these people I don't know, just like my friend, they want to be happy or they want to be free from suffering. But the on the spot practice is so great. You know, it's um, for me, there's when I drive and especially on like highways and you see like deer and coyote and it's like, oh, or it's like that hit of care and just like, you know, you're obviously not going to be free from suffering because you're gone. Right. <laughs> but for me, I do believe in other lifetimes or, you know, the possibility of that at least. And so, you know, may you come back in a more fortunate way. May you be at ease. So wherever we can find it in our life, it's such a beautiful practice. So thank you for the reflection. Yeah. A yeah. couple more. Um, I find it especially grounding and energizing when there's the part imagine your heart hmm. and i think that almost like it's like adding the fuel for me to practice so yeah. sometimes if i do compassion exercise or meta exercise on my own i don't 
practice that and like the somatic part yeah I find it really useful that's awesome yeah I think that you know it is interesting right that there is this feelingful area at our chest right and I do think also feeling the whole body with compassion and having it be more um, somatic can work well for some of us too. Ideally, at some point we get to, we get to a compassion practice where we bring to mind compassion and it doesn't even need to be a person or a thing and we can just feel it, right? That can take time um, and or that might just not be available. So yeah. Thank you. And I saw two other hands and then we'll, oh, yeah. Thanks, Cage. Stage runner. Uh, so it's, it's not amplified, but just so the folks online can hear. You got it, got it. Yeah. It's okay. So it's these people who have like a very good life, like they're very successful, they're like very happy. So they have very good karma. So Lama Island was says, yeah, if they don't any spiritual practice, they're just consuming their karma, right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> so that's sad. So that's a that's a reason for compassion, right? So yeah. Sad. But on the other hand, there's also rejoicing, right? Mm -hmm. So there's also like, okay, I rejoice that this these people have a good karma. So if you can tell me if you can tell a bit how to balance this kind of seemingly contradictory, like both compassion because they're wasting a the karma, but also yeah. rejoicing because they're wasting karma. <laughs> That's a really, I like that question. So, and some folks might not be familiar, but this idea that, you know, if you have like great good fortune in this life, likely it is um, accumulation of good merit in past lives. But if you're not using it in a way that is supporting other beings, it's like you're burning it, you know, and you're going to pay for it later. So you can have compassion for someone who's just like burning all this good for like, oh my gosh, you know, they're just, um, using it for material gain so then they're kind of stopping its momentum and um and then this idea of but we can also you know rejoice for people who are enjoying good fortune you know but the rejoicing the way that i learned it and feel it is rejoicing in the virtue of others not just their like material gain so I wouldn't just rejoice like, what a wonderful Porsche, right? <laughs> but like, wow, like what good goodness that being is. So I see them a little different. That's just how I, I learned it in the rejoicing. I can rejoice in the goodness of the natural world, which is a little different. And that isn't really virtue because it's just natural. But generally, I'm not just... Um, you know, and you can rejoice in the delight of others. Like maybe they're feeling delight in the moment, but I, I definitely see it more tied to virtue. So, yeah, thanks. Okay. I think, Kaza, you have a question? Oh, no, you're just, you're, you're running. Okay, great. As the cable snakes around the entire room. <laughs> I was so struck. Um, I was really struck by how the point about getting energy from it. And I was really struck by how much fullness I felt thinking about the first person who's a, um, a friend of mine going through some difficult stuff and thinking about the, the flood of love towards my friend made me appreciate even more what he brings into my life, knowing all of the things that um, he, the, the hardship he goes through just to kind of exist on a day-to-day -day basis. I felt this richness of the practice of compassion helped me see that regardless of, of um, how it impacts me or impacts others, just the challenges some people go through just to kind of to show up. So that felt very energizing. You felt that shared suffering and that mm. feeling, yeah, and gratitude um, that they exist. Uh, and then there were other people, or there was another person in particular where I felt this wall of resentment. And I was like, I could feel the compassion intellectually, but I was like holding it in, you know? Yeah. Like, uh, um, and then it was very interesting to feel a third person who I had done this very same exercise earlier this year for um, uh, in, in, uh, in your workshop. Yeah. 
and who I now have worked through all this stuff and don't feel any resentment mm. and how easy it was to access that compassion. And just to think, and it was very easy for me to access just how much resentment I had felt yeah. like six months ago. And just to see that change and to think, well, okay, well, it's possible for that resentment to go away if, 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 and I don't know how to finish that sentence. I was like, what happened in those six months? Yeah. I don't know, yeah. but I want to think about that a little bit. Beautiful description of equanimity. So equanimity is being able to clear, clearly see that these like grudges or preferences are always changing. So when we bring equanimity to our compassion practice, we break down any barriers between like, I, it's, I should for this person, but I can't for that person, right? And it's just beautiful to notice that change over time. You know, you can do this practice of compassion for the loved one, the person you don't know, and the person you don't like with the same person. So that would be live with them, right? It's like, I don't even know. I don't know what they're about. Like, I don't even whatever right and then so it's that like seeing and feeling that that is what helps that heart open all the way so thank you yeah so are you saying all of like the good and like being the good the bad well right i mean everyone is is good right and you know the fact that like <laughs> our our desire for our liking of someone that's the like dependent origination piece like our liking of someone is so dependent on this and that and when they do this but they don't do that right and it just it's it's such an illusion and when our compassion is contingent especially like oh i really care for that person because they're so good what if they do something wrong? Do we no longer care for them, right? Like, how do we get less contingent in our care? Yeah, yeah. Is it possible possible to feel compassion, but at the same time be detached? Oh yeah, that's compassion without equanimity, but aloofness. And it's kind of, it's not a true compassion. It's like a near enemy that might be more like pity. Right, where it's like, I care about you over there, but you're not like me, or you're not, you know, like we're like compassion is like, like, like you and I are the same. Yeah, the aloofness sometimes can be like a self protection or a lack of empathy, you know. I meant more in a sense of, um, feeling compassion for someone sometimes you know the other person wants to pull you into their drama and uh -huh. emotion yes so i guess maybe that you know detachment is not the right word but yes boundaries yes so that's you know is there a possibility of achieving that complete you know separateness or without being pulled into that a hundred percent and there might be people in our lives who we can only practice compassion with if there's like a hundred miles between us that's my family yeah <laughs> <laughs> we have the same family you know like yeah. like that you know and so we can and we do that right and that is a way to be caring with boundaries just as like a minor plug you know tens and choki will be teaching a compassion workshop here saturday she is so masterful at compassionate boundaries. Like that's really just such a clear way of loving yourself while loving another, but there's still care, there's still care. There's not the aloofness that can happen. Yeah, wonderful. So we're gonna, there's just a little tonight I wanna share from Storyland. Um, so, yeah, so as you all might remember, Buddha does this huge mic drop on um, dependent origination. So again, we're in the kind of most mature phase of the Buddha, like in this phase and stage of his life where he has a very mature Sangha. He has temples all over India, visiting them at different retreat seasons. And, you know, he's giving these teachings that are often refinements on prior teachings. And they're just getting like richer and richer. And he also has now a lot of senior students, many students who've attained enlightenment, many students who've practiced with him for decades. So such a richness of practice. 
And um, also a lot of jealousy. Like the Buddha takes up a lot of, like he's a big deal, right? An enlightened master and he's got all these temples and there are a lot of folks who are, are threatened by the Buddha. And, you know, just after he does this teaching on dependent origination, um, there's this story that apparently, again, these are all cobbled together stories, but in that same retreat season, several, um, several Brahmins conspire to falsely accuse the Buddha of sleeping with a woman and making her pregnant. So as you remember, at this time, like in a previous chapter, there's at least 63 different groups of other religious practitioners with different values, different ideas, different theories. So the Brahmins are just one of them. Um, so they found, you know, this group of Brahmins found an attractive young Brahma woman named Sinka and told her that the Buddha had caused a rapid decline in the faith of their ancestors by luring young men to become his disciples. Anxious to protect her faith, Sinka agreed to, to the plan. Every day she went to uh, Jetavana, which is the name of the retreat center, dressed in a beautiful sari and carrying a fresh bouquet of flowers. She did not arrive in time for the talks, but waited outside the Dharma hall as people left to return home. At first, when any, whenever anyone asked her where she was going or what she was doing, she only smiled. After several days, she answered coyly, I'm going where I'm going. After several weeks of such vague comments, she began to answer, I'm going to visit the monk, Gautama, or the Buddha. And finally, she was heard to exclaim, sleeping at Jetavana is delightful. So this is quite a protracted plot, right? So here she is showing up, just looking beautiful and coy with flowers. Oh, don't mind me. And then... Love sleeping here, love sleeping with the Buddha, essentially. Um, such words burned the ears of many people. Such lay people began to feel doubts and suspicions, but no one said anything. Then one day, Sinka came to one of the Buddha Dharma, uh, to one of the Dharma talks, uh, da, 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 and her belly was noticeably round. In the middle of the Buddha's discourse, she stood up and said loudly, loudly, Teacher Gautama, you speak eloquently about the Dharma. You are held in high esteem, but you care nothing for this poor woman made pregnant by you. The child I carry is your own. Are you going to take responsibility for your own child? A wave of shock passed through the community. Everyone looked up at the Buddha. But the Buddha just smiled calmly and replied, Miss, only you and I can know whether or not your claims are true. The Buddha's calm smile made Sinka feel uneasy, but she retorted, that's right, only you and I know whether my claims are true. The community could no longer suppress their astonishment. Several people stood up in anger. Sinka suddenly felt afraid that people would hurt her. She looked for a way to escape, but in her panic, she ran into a post and stumbled. As she strained to stand back up, a large round block of wood fell from where it was tied to her abdomen and landed on her foot. She cried out in pain and grabbed her crushed toes. Her stomach was now perfectly flat. A sigh of relief arose from the crowd. Several people began laughing and deriding her, but the, um, the, the nun Kema stood up and gently assisted Sinka out of the hall. When the two women were gone, the Buddha resumed his Dharma talk as if nothing had happened. So that's his style, right? That's how he goes. And then interestingly, he, he lays down this unbelievable teaching, but I thought the preamble was important. It's like... <laughs> This is, and it's just funny, like, you know, did this happen? Who knows? Is this a story passed down for thousands of years? Yes. Uh, anyway, so interesting. And I, 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 can, I can imagine that, you know, like there were, was a lot of suspicion. There was a lot of jealousy. There was, it's, it's not as though the Buddha, the Buddha roamed the land and everything was enlightened. No, right? There was a lot of people who were making difficulty. So he spoke. Community, the way of enlightenment can tear down the walls of ignorance, just as light can disperse shadows. The four noble truths, impermanence, non-self, dependent co-arising, the four establishments of mindfulness, and the seven factors of awakening. 
all have been proclaimed to the world like a lion's roar dispelling countless false doctrines and narrow view and narrow narrow views community the proclamation of the way of enlightenment is like a lion's roar do, do, do. Mm -hmm. when a person sees the dazzling truth he excl he exclaims we embrace dangerous views for so long taking existence mm -hmm. taking the imperm taking the impermanent to be permanent and believing in the existence of a separate self we took suffering to be pleasure and look at the and, and to look at the temporary as if it were eternal we mistook the false for the true, and now the time has come to tear down the walls of forgetfulness and false views. Community, the way of enlightenment allows humanity to remove, remove the thick veils of false views. When an enlightened person appears, the way echoes like the majestic sound of the rising tide. And when the tide rises, all false views are swept away. Community, people are easily caught by the four traps. The first is attachment to sensual desires. The second is attachment to narrow views. The third is doubt and suspicion. And the fourth is a false view of the self. The way of enlightenment helps people overcome these four great traps. Community, the teaching on dependent co-arising will enable you to overcome every obstacle and trap. Contemplate the nature of interdependence in your daily life, in your body, feelings, and mind. So then this becomes the lion's roar, the sutra of the lion's roar. And just this, again, kind of, we have seen, we are like an established sangha. We can tell that these teachings work right people are experiencing awakening they're experiencing freedom and again he's just tying together the simplicity of all the, all of these uh trainings together there is a, a whole chapter here on Sariputta. Some of you, Shariputta, may know this wonderful. He was a very senior student of the Buddha, quite beloved, quite accomplished. But I won't go into the whole story here and read it because it's many pages. But it is about the jealousy within the Sangha of the senior students. So again, even within like the close proximity of the Buddha, like all these people who really care about enlightening or enlightenment and practicing enlightenment, they're jealous of each other. They want more time with the Buddha. They don't like the students who get more attention. <laughs> I don't know why I find it funny, but it's like, wow, even that close to an enlightened being and humans are still going to act that way. It's kind of comforting. But um, <laughs> we're not that far. Um, and it's also, you know, it's interesting to just see how the Buddha handles it. And what I really notice in these stories over and over, when there is like a difficulty, when someone is falsely accusing the Buddha or falsely accusing Sariputta or doesn't like the Buddha, he's never like, oh, let's go away somewhere else where people like us or let's avoid the difficult. Let's do this in private. He brings it to the main hall. Like everybody, let's meet directly these difficulties because these are the human difficulties, jealousy, kind of plotting, you know, all of this. So interesting. And there is a lot in, in this and in these couple chapters about just jealousy, competition, judgment. So painful to live with these feelings, you know? And again, there's no way to really overcome them other than by directly kind of making them plain so that's in this uh right oh in this next chapter uh, and then oh good i think we have there's just like a little piece i wanted to share this is one of the most famous stories of the buddha uh, many people are familiar with this and again we're getting a pretty mature buddha quite along his way and he's traveling from one of his retreat centers to another. Um, and one day he spoke in Kesaputa. This is a village that belonged to the Kalama clan. Many young people gathered to hear him. They had all heard about the monk Gautama, but this was their first opportunity that they had to meet him in person. One man joined his palms and spoke. Teacher, for a long time, many Brahma priests have come here in order to teach their various doctrines. Each priest claims that his doctrine is superior to others. 
This has confused us. We don't know which path to follow. In fact, we've lost faith in all. We have heard that you are an enlightened master. Can you tell us who should we believe and who should we not believe? Who speaks the truth and who is just spreading false doctrine? This is like early fake news kind of. But at the spiritual level, um, and the Buddha answered, I can understand why you've given, given rise to doubts. Friends, do not be hasty to believe a thing, even if everybody repeats it, or even if it is written in Holy Scripture or spoken by a teacher revered by the people. Accept only those things which accord with your own reason, things which the wise and virtuous support, things which in practice bring benefit and happiness. Abandon those things which do not accord with your own reason, which are not supported by the wise and virtuous, and which in practice do not bring benefit and happiness. The Kalamas asked the Buddha to tell them more. He said, Suppose there, uh, tell them more. And the Buddha says, friends, suppose there is a person ruled by greed, anger, and ignorance. Will his greed, anger, and ignorance bring him happiness or, or suffering? They answered, greed and ignorance will cause the person to commit acts to bring suffering to himself and others. So is living by greed and anger supported by the wise and virtuous? No. And then the Buddha continued, Take the example of someone who lives according to loving kindness, compassion, empathetic joy, and equanimity, who makes others happy by relieving their suffering, who rejoices over the good fortune of others, and who treats others without discrimination. Will such qualities bring the person happiness or suffering? Teacher, such qualities will bring the person um, and all around them happiness. Are loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity supported by the wise and virtuous? Yes. And then he says, my friends, you are qualified to discern what to accept and discard. Believe and accept only those things which accord with your own reason, those things which are supported by the wise and the virtuous, those things which in practice bring benefit and happiness to yourselves and others. Discard those which oppose these principles. And these youth were encouraged by the Buddha's words. They saw his teaching did not require unconditional faith. The Buddha's way truly respected freedom of thought. So, yeah, just interesting. This is often kind of called the, you'll hear it called the like, come and see or try for yourself. Like never take these teachings, whether the Buddha's or anyone else's, unless it's something that has brought you benefit. And what this really points to, you know, he's supplying it here. He's supplying compassion, empathetic joy, um, loving kindness and equanimity as inner values. But we can't know what we believe in until we know what we value, right? And we all value something, even if we're not on an explicit spiritual path. It's how we make decisions throughout our day. And I just love this idea of getting closer and closer to what you truly value. That is the best way to discern, you know, whatever teachings or whatever path is most suitable or appropriate. Um, I just really appreciate that. There's such a relationship between what we value, the purpose in our life, and the meaning in our life. And a happy life is a meaningful life. A happy life isn't just a life of temporary joys, right? It is a meaningful life. So that, yeah, it just felt very beautiful. So with that, we're going to dedicate our merits. We have a couple um, announcements we'd like to share with folks. So just taking a moment and returning. Hmm. And finding the breath, reconnecting to the body and the breath. And reigniting that sense of compassion for all beings. The true purpose of our time here together tonight and every night. That some of our energy, intention, some of our connections here could truly be in the service that each and every being could know a sense of peace and ease, that each and every being could be free 
that each and every being with no belongings be healthy and safe, know their true nature. Thanks for your presence and your reflections. We, as I mentioned, we have a really amazing teaching opportunity this weekend. Tenzin Chioki, I mentioned this last time. She's such an exceptional practitioner, decades of practice, super joyful, super fun, very socially engaged, just a wonderful teacher teaching a half day. Um, as always, we appreciate your support, either one time or ongoing monthly. We're still always looking for volunteers, so you can talk to Cage about that. 